Welcome to I Can Science That. Let's science a paper by Wang Zheng and Yao called Generalized Sanyak Effect, and it's from 2004. Wang Zheng and Yao have created a rather novel little device, and they've done an experiment. I've been talking about this paper a few times already. This time, I want to take it a little more carefully, step by step, and do the math uh, to see exactly what does this experiment show, what it does not show, and let's try to evaluate, is this paper support for special relativity? Is this paper rejection of special relativity? Does this paper support the idea of a preferred frame of reference? Could this device be used to determine if we have a preferred frame of reference? I have been stating in previous videos that the device makes no statement whatsoever and cannot be used to determine whether or not we have a preferred frame of reference. But uh, as we go through this, um, we'll find out if I'm right about that or not. Frankly, at this point, I'm starting to think maybe it can be used for that, but I haven't got to that point yet. We'll see what we find. Let's keep our minds open and see whether that's true or not. Okay, let's take a look at the device. Um, here's, the, here's the basic setup, and I'm just going to use this slide here to look at the setup. We have a fiber optic gyro here, and I am assuming that everyone has a basic understanding of what a fiber optic gyro is and how it works. That's another video I really ought to make at some point. And if I ever do make that video right up here, we're going to see boop, a link to that other video. So future me will make a video and put it up here someday, maybe. Okay, people from the future, after you've watched that video and now you're back, I will just summarize what a fiber optic gyro is so that we're all on the same page with what's important about it. To summarize a fiber optic gyroscope, we have a, a beam source of light and it goes and it is split to go in opposite direction through a single piece of fiber optic cable. Those two beams then meet back up at an interferometer and we then determine whether there has been a phase shift in the light coming from either direction. Hopefully what we know about a fiber optic gyroscope is that if you rotate the device, the path lengths will be different, the phase will shift. Apologies to the co-authors. I'm just going to refer to this by the lead author's name, Wang, for now. What Wang has done is added an extension to the gyroscope's fiber optic cable and wrapped it around um, these pair of wheels here. Uh, the cable then comes out of the fiber optic gyro, goes around what I'm calling the racetrack, goes around the racetrack, and then returns into the fiber optic gyroscope for interferometry as before. We will have one beam of light going around counterclockwise and another beam of light going around clockwise. You will also notice the fiber optic gyro is on a conveyor of some kind and is being pushed to the left. And I'll keep that consistent in all of my diagrams that the fiber optic gyroscope is moving to the left. The cables are moving at the same speed as the gyroscope. The cable on the, what is the lower side or the near side to us of this setup is moving parallel with and at the same speed as the gyroscope. And then the opposite side returns back at the opposite velocity. So it's moving against the speed. Spoiler alert, we're going to find that this whole wheel setup is not relevant to anything and it's just an overcomplication um, but that was an interesting experiment to try, to see if that matters. What Wang found is that it does not matter um, that, <laughs> that the wheel is spinning uh, at all. What's important is that the fiber optic gyro is moving. Let me illustrate here uh, the beams of light coming out of the fiber optic gyro as the gyroscope moves. Here's my fiber optic gyro. Here's the racetrack. Um, and I'm indicating that as the light comes out and goes around the racetrack, the fiber optic gyro moves. Uh, and so the return position where the, where the light returns back into the gyroscope is not the same as where it leaves. This is where the light leaves the gyroscope. 
here's where the light returns to the gyroscope. And I should emphasize, I have greatly exaggerated the amount of motion that the gyroscope does. We are talking about tiny fractions of a meter. A beam of light comes out of the fiber optic gyro. And let's go clockwise first. It goes from point A to point B to join the racetrack. And then at point B, heads clockwise around the racetrack on over to D, where it loops around the racetrack back over to C and comes back. Now, in reality, the beam goes around this racetrack several times, but on the final trip, it comes from C and it's heading back into the gyroscope. Remember, the gyroscope has moved to the left, and so it has to go a little extra distance before returning to the gyroscope. And it does that right there. That's the beam of light going clockwise. And I have drawn that beam in green. Just for clarity of diagrams, I will draw the opposite beam in red. In reality, this is the exact same color of light that's important. But for my diagrams, I'm showing a green beam and a red beam. OK, so our counterclockwise beam now it goes from A to B, just like the green one did. And then it heads the opposite direction. It goes over to C first, C back to D. It's going to go, in reality, it's going to go around a whole bunch of times. And then on the final trip, it'll go from D back to E. And once again, the fiber optic gyro has moved. So it's not going to go all the way back to point B. It's going to take that turn at point E and cut out early. As we go through the paper, there were a few things that were a little hard to follow, and it took a few reads to figure out what everything means. And so I've put together a page of definitions. Pause it here if you're confused about what any of the terms mean. I will try to use the same nomenclature as they use in the paper to make everything translate nicely. Also, I have pulled out as an example from one of the runs, one of the experiments that they did, um, the numbers that they provide. And um, that's all here. OK, uh, I have added in, they did not provide the index of refraction for their fiber optic cable. But they did mention that the index of refraction did not seem to affect anything. So I'm referencing here, as an example, a fairly generic value, what, what it might be to remain consistent with their empirical results. We're going to need to show that the index of refraction somehow does not affect the results. And that's, that's an interesting piece of data in itself. Right here, right in the abstract, it is independent of the type of motion and the refractive index of the waveguides waveguides being the racetrack pattern. Um, and so the, uh, the, the index of refraction does not matter. Uh, we'll see that right here. An air core fiber was used to verify that the phase difference is independent of the refractive index and various types of motion. That gives us uh, an easy way to look at this thing, as if the index of refraction does not matter. Let's imagine doing this whole thing in vacuum. The math will be considerably simpler that way. So let's just look at it in vacuum. And in vacuum, the motion of the cables shouldn't matter in terms of the cables moving with or against the direction of the light. Well, it's now we're imagining that we're in vacuum, and so you can't have vacuum be physically moving. So based on that point of view, we can kind of already see, which they said also in the paper, that the motion around the racetrack, the cable moving around the racetrack, has no impact on the final results. It is, therefore, only the motion of the fiber optic gyro that is influencing our result. So let's look instead at why does this then create a fringe pattern. It does because the fiber optic gyroscope is moving. Um, and, and why does that matter? The red beam goes around and then kind of cuts out early, just a little bit, 
while the green bean, going the opposite way, doesn't get to cut out early, it has to stay after class. In the space of the laboratory, the red bean goes through a slightly shorter path than the green beam does. The green beam has to go all the way around the loop plus a little more to catch up with the moving fiber optic gyro. Whereas the red beam doesn't even get to make it all the way around the racetrack before returning to the gyro. The path lengths of the two beams as the paths of light move through the room are different. And I do want to emphasize this is a little confusing because the length of fiber optic cable is identical for both the red and the green. It's the same cable, so its length is not different going in different directions. But the cable is moving through space. It's moving through the lab as we do the experiment. And so the light is being recorded moving through different distances through the lab. And how much is that? I think we can see from the diagram if we have this fiber optic gyro moving at a speed v and it takes time t for the light to go round the loop, then the amount of distance that the gyro has moved is v times t. Uh, and looking at these two, it should be fairly clear that the red beam subtracts VT from its total distance, and the green beam adds one VT to its total difference. So if we subtract green minus red, we're going to get two. There's two times. The green beam has to go once through VT on its first lap, and then once again on the last lap whereas the red beam just cuts that out entirely. So the total delta path, delta P, the path length difference, is two times VT. Let me pause here uh, on the T. The T is a little confusing because uh, the red beam has a shorter path length drawn in the diagram than the green beam does. The red beam should arrive back at the fiber optic gyro much sooner than the green beam does. And doesn't that mean that the T's are different for these two diagrams? No, because that's not what we mean by T. Uh, the T has to be the same for both of these because we want to compare the phase shift. Right? We're going to let the light go around the loop in both directions. And then after some time t, we'll look and see uh, how long the path was for red and how long the path was for green coming there. To understand how that works, remember that these are continuous beams. We're just going to turn on the beam, and the beam is just going to continue coming and coming and coming. What's really happening then is the green beam is going to go round and round and round, and the green beam arrives in the fiber optic gyro. And at that point, the red beam will have already arrived. The red beam has been there a while. Uh, when the green beam first gets there, let's say the first peak of the green beam gets there, the first peak of the red beam has already come, and now we're, we're trailing down. It's coming, the, the wave will be coming down, and it'll be a different phase of the wave. So in order to compare those two phases, we will need the, them to arrive at the same place. So this must be the same distance. That means the amount of time between the time the light first came out and the time the light arrived, we're going to need to be, have that be the same amount of time. And for a time, we're going to need to pick a time. <laughs> we're going to need to pick a time. And to make the calculations easy, this is uh, what, what Wang did. Uh, we just take the loop time, the total loop time, capital L, which is the time to go around the racetrack, our 11 times, that whole time. And the time for that is the full distance divided by the speed of light. And again, we'll just take speed of light in vacuum for our first run. 
So just plugging that in, we get here equation two. So the path difference between these two is just 2VL over C. Okay. Now, they don't quote path difference, though we don't measure path difference. We're going to measure a phase difference. And that means the, the light is a wave, it's coming up and down, and when we when they arrive, what we can compare is the phase difference, and they are going to quote that phase difference in radians. So just here's that equation two again, and let's convert from path length difference into phase difference. So the first thing we do there is we're going to take the path length difference, which is in meters now, and divide by the wavelength of the light. So that's the the path length varies by a certain amount, and that's in meters. The wavelength is in meters, and we're going to divide those and see how many wavelengths of shift is there. And then we need to convert that into radians. So that's 2 pi. 2 pi is one rotation around, and one wavelength then is considered one rotation around. So to convert that, we'll just multiply by 2 pi. So we're going to take 2 pi times this, divided by lambda for wavelength, and we get equation 3. And this is, that's it. I mean, that's the whole, the whole thing right there. This is the same equation that Wang uses in the, the paper itself. So you can see we have derived the equation simply by imagining this whole setup going through vacuum. And they have insisted that the index of refraction somehow does not matter, and so we should be allowed to do that. Uh, and we did that, and we found this is how it works. And here's their experimental results, just clipped from the paper, and you can see these, these little dots and, and circles are the experimental results, and the line is that theoretical equation we just derived right there. Once again, index of refraction does not matter. The shape of the racetrack does not matter. The only thing we're using here in this equation is the length of the racetrack does matter, the wavelength of the light matters, and the velocity of the moving fiber optic gyro matters. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. The length of the fiber optic cable never changes. It's, it's one cable, and the light goes through the whole cable no matter which direction it's going through and yet we do get a fringe shift. This tells us that we are not measuring speed through glass. Uh, that's not what's causing the fringe shift because it's the same amount of glass either way. Instead, we are somehow measuring the speed through space. The fiber optic gyro is moving through space, moving through the laboratory, and that is the speed the speed V is the speed of the fiber optic gyroscope. Next, the velocity of the cable does not appear in any of our calculations. We did this whole setup without considering the movement of the cable at all. And indeed, I, I showed the quotes from the Wang paper. They agree that the shape of the moving cable has no bearing on this whatsoever. What is relevant is the velocity of the fiber optic gyro itself. The velocity of the fiber optic gyro appeared in that equation as V, and it is relevant. It's directly proportional to the amount of phase shift. Now, a point on this, what do I mean by velocity? Aren't all velocities supposedly relative? Yes, yes, we worked everything. Everything we did in this example was worked in the reference frame of the lab. All velocities were quoted relative to the floor of the lab. So this tells us now that the lab itself was our reference frame and movement relative to the lab was measured as a fringe shift. Does that mean that the lab is a preferred reference frame, or, or perhaps the lab lives in a preferred reference frame. We have some preferred reference frame. Would this all work in some other reference frame? 